We're too busy looking in the past. Time to go back to the future. James Van Hoften goes on to say this about the radiation problems encountered on future moon missions. If excessive exposures are predicted or do occur, the mission may be altered. An EVA may be cancelled or the astronauts brought home early. But good luck predicting such exposures. We didn't have the technology to predict solar flares in the Apollo days, and we still don't have that technology now. Unfortunately, the prediction and forecasting of solar activity and space weather are severely hampered by incomplete understanding of how the Sun affects interplanetary space and the local environments of the Earth, the Moon, and Mars. Scientific progress in this field, leading to accurate long-term and short-term predictions of the space radiation environment, will contribute to the role that solar and space physics scientists can play in human exploration missions. Previously we learned that out of all the 1400 solar flares that occurred during the Apollo missions, there were 30 major X-ray flares. Some opponents have questioned how many of these flares were proton events, claiming that only proton events can hurt you. In actuality, both X-ray flares and proton flares will hurt you in much the same way. Van Hoften says this about solar particle events. Biological effects are similar to those from X-rays or gamma rays. He also says this about cosmic rays. Shielding is ineffective because ions penetrate hundreds of centimeters of material and produce secondary radiation. Returning to solar radiation... If solar heavy ions pose a radiation hazard to astronauts, that hazard will generally occur in the first few hours of the event, just at the time when the astronauts may be caught outside and under minimal shielding. Finally, even if solar heavy ions are a negligible radiation hazard for astronauts, it should be noted that they can have significant impacts on spacecraft electronics. The NOAA Space Environment Center SEC, declares that an SPE is underway when the number of protons with energy greater than 10 million electron volts exceeds 10 square centimeters per second per steradian. During most of the solar cycle, there are roughly 10 SPEs per year meeting this criterion. Each event will require the attention of those responsible for astronaut radiation hazards. Some will turn out to be too low in peak flux or total fluence to be an issue for the astronauts. Most will be large enough to have some impact on concurrent lunar missions, from delaying or shortening an EVA up to aborting the mission. The lack of multiple-day prediction severely limits risk management alternatives for human spaceflight. In effect, a crew on a spacecraft or a team of astronauts at a remote site on the moon must react to an event after it begins, limiting the time and options for evasive actions, if warranted, to a few hours. The protons and PPS models were developed under the paradigm that the particle acceleration occurred at the site of the associated X-ray flare. However, there is little correlation between the time, location, and magnitude of a flare, and the time, location, and speed of an associated CME eruption, other than a general relationship that very active solar regions generate large CMEs and big flares. Hence, current forecasting models do badly in predicting extreme events, and extreme events represent the greatest danger to human spaceflight crews. Obviously, the short-term radiation exposure must be pretty bad if it will severely limit the amount of time one can spend out walking on the moon. And if you think it's safer inside the spacecraft than on the outside, think again. Among other things, NASA has developed a new pressurized rover called LER, the Lunar Electric Rover. The plan is lunar rovers would be sent up to the moon before astronauts arrive. And when they arrive, they'd live in the rovers for two or three weeks at a time, not in spacesuits, but in shirt sleeves. It's a fully pressurized cabin. And in case you're wondering, yes, it does come with cup holders. That's a big step for mankind. It is. <laughs> Think that will protect the astronauts? According to James Van Hoften, Extending the EVA time also increases the probability that it will coincide with an SPE. 
Because it is mobile, the pressurized rover, like the other rovers, could not depend on in-situ shielding at the outset of an SPE unless it found a convenient, naturally occurring garage in a lunar lava tube or cave. Needless to say, NASA's plans on solving the radiation problem have been sorely inadequate. For lunar outpost missions, NASA plans on bringing along inflatable bunkers that they cover up under tons of lunar soil. Inflatables can be used as connectors or tunnels between crew quarters and can provide radiation shelter if covered with lunar soil. This is exactly what Dr. Ernest Oppik proposed for long stays on the moon in 1969. This method would certainly work, but this luxury would not be available to astronauts during short-term visits or during the time that they are actually digging up all that regolith to bury the shelter under. Van Hoften agrees. He writes, For lunar sortie missions, it is likely that regolith shielding will not be practical. For those keeping score, on lunar sortie missions, astronauts are expected to stay on the moon for only one week. About the same amount of time Apollo astronauts supposedly spent in cislunar space in general. We established already that even minor solar flares could deliver an excess of 25 ram per hour depending on how many centimetres of water shielding are used. Scientists working on the Orion capsule claim they have overcome the hazards posed by minor flares, but Van Hoften has doubts when it comes to the major flares. Preliminary analyses by NASA and Lockheed Martin indicate that the Orion capsule provides adequate shielding from its structure, avionics, life support, other hardware, consumables, and waste storage, such that lower energy SPEs would not be a threat. However, for the rarer, higher energy events, doses could accumulate beyond the acceptable limit. For this reason, the Orion capsule itself must either incorporate sufficient shielding, or else have the capability to reconfigure shielding and functional hardware to provide a radiation storm shelter for the astronauts. The duration of the most hazardous portion of an SPE, or a close series of SPEs, can be hours to a few days. Thus, the Orion capsule must be capable of providing the storm shelter capability for a somewhat extended period of time, and astronauts must have access to food, water, and minimum hygiene facilities. Although it will be permissible to leave the radiation storm shelter for short periods, minutes to fractional hours, to meet personal needs or perform a task required for mission success, the astronauts should spend the duration of an SPE inside the shelter. Such shelters have been proposed by astrophysicists John H. Molden and Gene Parker. Molden proposes a ship with 2 meters of water shielding. Parker proposes a ship with 5 meters of water shielding. Now, it doesn't have to be water shielding. The mass equivalent of polyethylene would have the exact same effect. It would just be much less bulky and thus take up a whole lot less volume. However, it would still be way too heavy. Both physicists have also proposed giving the spacecraft its own electromagnetic field similar to what the Earth has to deflect away the charged particles. This proposal, however, is still under study, and the electromagnetic field may itself be dangerous to humans. Another proposal is to electrify the outer walls of the capsule to 10 billion volts, creating an electrostatic charge that would repel away those particles. Good luck with that! The largest Van de Graaff generator in the world, located at the Boston Science Museum, produces only 2 million volts. We need 5,000 times that amount! No propagandist denies that the radiation encountered on a manned Mars flight is a life or death obstacle for astronauts, and thus the shielding problems must be overcome. Even though, one proposal in the Apollo Applications Program was to send a crew around Venus sheltered in nothing more than the Apollo Command Capsule and an empty S-4B stage. Unless, of course, they think the radiation encountered on a trip to Venus is as safe as they think it is on the way to the Moon. Still, the fact remains that to fly to asteroids and Mars, you need a radiation shelter. 
This shelter will no doubt be a necessity if Obama's plans are to go ahead. If they ever do manage to put this radiation shelter in place, that would certainly be enough to convince me that it's real. Now how do we shield astronauts from radiation on longer missions? How do we harness resources on distant worlds? How do we supply spacecraft with energy needed for these far-reaching journeys? These are questions that we can answer and will answer. And these are the questions whose answers no doubt will reap untold benefits right here on Earth. Hell, if they can solve the radiation problems, I'd like to go. And NASA still aims to return to the moon, but it's now likely to take decades.